Welcome to People, Places, Planet Pod, the official podcast of the Environmental Law Institute, a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization working to ensure a healthy environment, prosperous economies, and vibrant communities founded on the rule of law. On May 18, 1971, Pennsylvania's voters ratified by a four to one margin what is now Article 1, Section 27 of the state constitution, the Environmental Rights Amendment. The amendment asserts the people's right to clean air, pure water, and the preservation of the natural, scenic, historic, and aesthetic values of the environment, identifying Pennsylvania's public natural resources as the common property of all people, including generations yet to come. It also explicitly entrusts the Commonwealth with the preservation of these resources for the public good. Fifty years later, with climate change now the overriding threat to the health of the planet, The architect of Pennsylvania's landmark environmental rights amendment makes the case for an environmental amendment to the United States Constitution. We're joined today by Franklin L. Curry, who served in the Pennsylvania House of Representatives from 1966 to 1972 and the Pennsylvania Senate from 1972 to 1980. As a state representative, Curry was the author and lead advocate of the legislative proposal that became the environmental rights amendment to the Pennsylvania Constitution. In his new book, The Constitutional Question to Save the Planet, the People's Right to a Healthy Environment, Curry advocates for the enactment of a federal environmental rights amendment and a treaty to extend its reach into the international community as the basis for combating the existential threat that is climate change. Thank you for joining us today, Franklin. As a fellow Pennsylvania native who actually attended a workshop on Article 1, Section 27 just a few years ago as a Bucknell University student, this this conversation hits quite close to home. And as you advocate for the adoption of the amendment's principles at a national and even international scale, I'm hopeful that our listeners will appreciate some of the broad lessons to be gleaned from Pennsylvania's amendment. I think the broadest lesson from Pennsylvania's amendment is that it provides in the framework of government the concept that the public has a basic right as human beings, a basic human right to a decent, healthy environment, and that the government is responsible for providing that. That's that's what really comes out of this amendment. Yeah, there's something extremely universal about that, I think. Um, Well, yes, I mean, in 1992, I think it was, the United Nations at one of its first international conferences on the environment put out a declaration that it said a healthy environment is a basic human right. Mm -hmm. Now, that was a declaration. It it wasn't binding. But the thing about my my amendment made that binding in Pennsylvania because it's part of the Constitution, and everybody who goes into public office in Pennsylvania, whether they are a legislator or a judge or a governor or anybody else, has to take an oath of office. When you get elected, you cannot take office to take an oath to uphold the Constitution. And that means you have to uphold Article 1, Section 27. So that's the, that's the big thing we did. We put it in the Constitution. The government's obligated to do that, and people can bring lawsuits if they think government is not doing it. They can go to court to ask the court to review the situation, which is another great point about the amendment. So. To get us started here today, I'd actually like to sort of go back to the beginning with the amendment. In your book, you talk about the birth of Article 1, Section 27. Can you tell our listeners the story of how Pennsylvania's Environmental Rights Amendment came to be ratified in 1971? Yes, it all started in 1966 when I became a candidate for the Pennsylvania House of Representatives from the Northumberland County, Montour County District. I was running against a senior Republican in the House, and I was running on the issue that I would vote and I would seek a a new clean streams law. The incumbent had voted against it. That was my issue. I had no idea of doing a constitutional amendment, but I won. I won the election. It was a great upset. And it sent me to Harrisburg. And when the Democrats took control, I became a member of the House Conservation Committee. And in that period, 1968 to 1972, that committee 
processed more environmental legislation than in the entire history of the state before or since. We, we were in really in an environmental revolution in Pennsylvania. And we passed bills like a clean streams bill, clean air bill, a strip mining bill, waste disposal bill, and on and on, about 12 different bills. And in the middle of that, I thought to myself, well, no, wait a minute. It's nice to pass bills, but pill, bills can, are easily repelled or modified. And uh, we need to do something to be sure that all these gains have some sense of permanency. And then I read in the New York Times that they were amending their state constitution on forest lands. Well, Pennsylvania didn't have any kind of an amendment. And I said, well, that's what we need. We need an amendment to our constitution to give some permanency to what we're doing and to establish the clean environment as a, as a fundamental state duty and fundamental state right for its citizens. So that's how I got to thought of the bill. And in 1969, I introduced it. And then as I introduced it, it had three basic principles. First, it provided that the state of Pennsylvania citizens had a right to clean air, pure water, et cetera, basically a healthy environment. The second sentence said that the public natural resources of Pennsylvania belong to all the people, including future generations. Now, by that, I meant the air and the streams, et cetera. And the final sentence said that the state government, Commonwealth, shall, have, shall be trustee of these resources uh, and has an obligation to conserve them for all the people. So that's the way I introduced it. It, it, it. it was amended several times in the Senate and in the House. But finally, it was passed in the uh, first legislative session. And now in Pennsylvania, constitutional amendments have to go through two legislative sessions in the same form, then go before the public. Well, it passed at 69-70 session. So I, in 71, I got re I got reelected in 70 and 71 I introduced it in January in February it passed the house and the senate and it went on the ballot in May 8 for the May 18th election in 1971 along with four other proposed constitutional amendments now to get that approved by the public I was forced, and we had a number of statewide organizations endorsed it and pushed it, like the Pennsylvania Federation of Sportsmen's Clubs, which is headed by John Ladadio, who was also the chairman of the House Conservation Committee. The Pennsylvania League of Women Voters got very much involved uh, and supported. Pennsylvania Environmental Council was a strong supporter. Pennsylvania Bar Association endorsed it. The other thing is I prepared a question and answer sheet explaining it, which I sent about um, three weeks in advance of the election to every newspaper in Pennsylvania. And I thought that was helpful. Well, anyhow, on election day, May 18th, the Environmental Rights Amendment passed by a four to one margin. It was a million some odd votes to 250,000. It was stunning. Women's rights, which was also on the ballot that day, passed by only two to one. And, I, and I'm not minimizing the importance of that, but I, I often kid my wife about the environmental rights got twice the votes that women's rights did on that day. I, and I could explain that, but it, both were important. How that's what happened. Other amendment, one other amendment passed barely and two others were rejected. So it shows the people of Pennsylvania knew what they were doing. They sized up these amendments and they voted. And that's how it got to where, how we got it on the books. Well, thank you for providing some context on that. Could you speak to some of the early challenges and perhaps triumphs of the amendment um, when it was first ratified? Well, when it was ratified or approved by the voters in May, uh, Governor Schaaf almost immediately used it to challenge the construction of a tower at Gettysburg, the Gettysburg Tower case, which was to be constructed by a private corporation in a way overlooking the battlefield. And he thought that, Governor Schaap thought that that was a, an infringement on the public's right to have a 
to see the battlefield the way it was. So he brought that lawsuit in, uh, in the Adams County Court. Adams County is where, bat was where the Gettysburg battlefield was located. And the court ruled against him. They didn't think he approved his case, even though he had, he brought in his expert witnesses. People like Bruce Catton, a prominent Civil War historian. He brought in Louis Kahn, the great uh, architect. And he brought in Sylvester Stevens, the state uh, historian. They testified this should not be built because it violated the idea of the sanctity of a battlefield. But anyhow, the court ruled against it. But the court, and it went to the Supreme Court, and they, they affirmed that. But there was one important point in that case, even though Governor Schaap, loss on the merits, the court did say the, the amendment is self-sustaining. Now, this is very important because a lot of people argued, well, not, it's not, you can't bring a lawsuit unless it provides for lawsuits to enforce it. And uh, the court said, no, you don't have to. It, it is self-sustaining. If you think your rights violated, you may bring the case, whether we rule for you or against you. So I thought that was a very important victory. And by the way, I always thought the amendment was self-sustaining. After all, look at the look at the amendments to the U.S. Constitution, the first amendment on free speech, et cetera. There's nothing they're saying you got to, uh, there's, there's nothing further authorizing lawsuits. It's just there and you can do what you want with it. So I, I was pleased with that. Now, the second thing that came along was kind of a setback. In Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania, there is a river commons along the north branch of the Susquehanna, which is several acres of a park. And the state of Pennsylvania, the highway department, through Jacob Kassab, the secretary of transportation, wanted to take three-tenths of an acre of that land for a new bridge or some other improvement up there. And um, Marion Payne, a prominent citizen in Wilkes-Barre, and some college students challenged that in court saying that violated the Article 1, Section 27. This is, and that made it the case of Payne versus Kassab. And the courts with that case set up a test a, 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 for whether or not the constitutional amendment was violated. It, violated. it was a three-part test. They asked three questions. Has the uh, developer, in this case, the Department of Transportation, done everything they can to minimize damages to the environment. Secondly, have they complied with all environmental laws? And thirdly, uh, do the benefits of the project outweigh the damage to the environment? And based on a three-part test, the Payne versus Kassab test, they, they ruled against Mrs. Payne. So that, that became the law of Pennsylvania for the next 35 or 40 years. And a lot of cases were brought, but they went nowhere because of this test. It was it always came out in favor of the developer. So that was a real setback. And as I said in my book, this is how the courts of Pennsylvania anesthetized Article 1, Section 27 up until the year 2013. So it sounds like for a number of years, the amendment lay rather dormant as a sort of general policy statement, given that pain test. Can can you tell us a bit about how it began to grow more teeth and how the courts um, reinterpreted the amendment, particularly with the conversation around natural gas drilling in Pennsylvania, and you said around 2013? Well, yes. What happened was that, first of all, there were people who were very upset with this. Uh, John Dernbach, a professor at Widener Law School, was very upset. He wrote a series of articles in the Dickinson Law Review challenging the Payne versus Kassab test as being unrelated to the language of the state constitution. That was published in the late 1990s. And in my first book, I noted that this, what happened, but I said, I'm not giving up because courts can always change their mind. And I think it is. Is, is something's going to happen here. Well, in 2013, it happened. That was a case of Robinson Township. And uh, what happened was the number of people, including the Delaware Riverkeeper and others, brought a lawsuit challenging 
the Pennsylvania oil and gas law, the Marcellus Shale law, on the grounds that it violated Article 1, Section 27. And it went all the way to the Supreme Court. And this chief justice was Ronald Castile, who had been a lifetime prosecutor in Philadelphia. And the DA's office was DA down there before I was elected Supreme Court judge. Maybe our justice, but he became the chief justice, and he was very interested in the environment. So when the case got to him, got to the court, he used his power as chief justice to assign the case to himself. So when he and his staff spent a good deal of effort researching Article 1, Section 27, and as a result, they came out with the Robinson Township case, which really put new life, new vitality in the Article 1, Section 27. Castile ruled that the people interpreting the law to date, like in Payne versus Kassab, were ignoring the plain language of the amendment. And he said to the courts of Pennsylvania, read the English language. And when you apply that, that's the test to use for this or interpreting Article 1, Section 27, the, the plain language, not Payne versus Kassab. And as a result, he threw out two sections of the oil and gas law. And with that, the, the case really had new teeth and new vitality. Thank you, Franklin. Can, can you speak a bit to how the revived amendment has been applied in more recent years uh, to advance goals of environmental protection within the state? Well, yes. Uh, uh, two years later, John Child brought the Pennsylvania Environmental Defense Fund case against the state legislature. What the legislature had done was take money, which had been from the oil from the uh, from the oil and gas fund, which was by law supposed to be used for environmental purposes only. But the legislature, in its desire to avoid a tax increase, is had to shift the money to the general fund budget. And Child's case said that this was a violation of the, when it got to the Supreme Court again, this, it, uh, the court said that uh, this was unconstitutional when they had to change that. So that's, that's what, that's a PEDF case. And since then it's been applied and it's, 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 it's being litigated quite active has a lot of vitality. For example, in the uh, there's a case pending now to use it to stop plastic bags. That case is pending, I don't know the outcome. I know in the, the Delaware River Basin Commission has stopped fracking, has issued an order stopping fracking in the, in the Delaware River Basin Commission portion of Northeastern Pennsylvania. And uh, that is being challenged and uh, I know there's lots of uh, cases that, or petitions are being uh, offered against that, uh, against those who are challenging, but all, upholding the basin's decision on the grounds that it is in compliance with Article 1, Section 27. So I'd say there's a great deal of, uh, uh, of litigation out there. But beyond that, the amendment is very much alive in the state government. For example, if you go to the Department of Environmental Protection and you want to do something, uh, uh, if you want a permit that involves the affecting the environment, like a stream permit, put a dam through or a waterway or something like that, or any kind of a project involving the land, you have to fill out a long form called uh, uh, called uh, uh, Form 9, in which you have to describe what you're doing and how it affects the environment, et cetera, et cetera. So the state agencies are paying more to have paid attention to it. The Fish Commission and the Boat Commission use it as a policy statement. And uh, I think most of the state government uses it as a policy guide. So I think it's having a lot of impact. But the other impact it's had is that other states are beginning to follow suit. Uh, Hawaii and Montana have similar amendments, which adopted after 1971. And uh, 
There's an organization called the Green Amendment, led by Maya Van Rossum, the Delaware Riverkeeper, to have other states adopt the, uh, the amendment or something like it. And five or six states are considering some version of Article 1, Section 27. On November 3rd of this year, the New York State people, uh, in New York State, the people will be voting on an amendment to their constitution, which will, which will add a, the Environmental Rights Amendment to the, uh, uh, to the New York Constitution. So that'll be, that's passed the legislature. It's up for the voters of New York to adopt it if they, uh, if they want it, and I sure hope they do. So it's, it is now alive and well. Thank you for that. It, it's great to see state green amendments sort of catching on, and I imagine you feel similarly about that. Um, in, I was hoping now we could turn to um, a discussion of the federal level. So in, in the preface to your book, you say that what our climate will be like in 2071 depends in large measure on what we do in the immediate future to enact the Article 1, Section 27 principles into our national constitution. Um, can you speak a bit about the value of adopting a federal environmental rights amendment similar to that which we have in Pennsylvania and now which numerous other states um, have adopted themselves? If we have something like Article 1, Section 27, as part of the U.S. Constitution, it will dramatically change the role of government. Government, you know, U.S. government will become the trustee of our natural resources and they will have the duty of providing a decent environment. That is not there, and as a result, the state, federal government over the years has done a lot to promote, for example, fossil fuels. Uh, out in Oregon, there's an organization called the Children's Trust, which, was, uh, which is headed by Julie Olson, and she brought a case in the federal district court. It's still pending out there in the Juliana case. And this case contends that in the Fifth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, it is implied that the people have a right to a decent environment. What she is relying on is a provision in the Fifth Amendment that no one's life or property may be taken without due process of law. Well, she's having a very difficult time with that case because it, it's, impl it's, in her mind, implicit. It's not explicit. The amendment I'm proposing would make it explicit that we have a right to a decent environment and the federal government should do something about it. So that's why I'm for it. Now, let me point out that when the U.S. Constitution was originally enacted and or passed in 1787, that Constitution was silent on a natural environment. There was no reason to be anything else because resources were so abundant, nobody had any doubts about any, any concern about the future. The, the Constitution was also silent on slavery. It was, it was silent on women's political rights. Now, after the Civil War, the slavery uh, issue was, into the, was put into the Constitution by the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, which abolished slavery, which gave everybody born in the United States citizenship, regardless of race, and which also gave them the right to vote, regardless of race. So that it took 100 years, but that happened. Women's political rights took another 100 years. That was not adopted until 1919 with the 19th Amendment. So those two areas of silence have now been filled in. Uh, but the environmental amendment, the environmental silence is still there. And my, I, want to, I think it's long overdue to break the environmental silence of the U.S. Constitution because now climate change is so dramatic and so, such an impending threat on our world that we need to devote our full efforts as a government and as a people to stopping it. And that's why I think putting this in the amendment to the in, in the United States Constitution would be a great step forward, and uh, why I'm calling for the ending of the silence of the U.S. Constitution on our natural environment. Thank you, Franklin. It, it's interesting that you mentioned that. Um, I was when I was talking to a friend about um, the podcast that we'd be recording here today. Um, he said something to me like, 
well, isn't that already an amendment to the United States Constitution? And I said, no, no you might think that it should be, but there, there's actually no mention of um, these sorts of environmental provisions in constitutional amendments um, or the Constitution itself for that matter. And so I think um, although folks might assume that that would be the case and that it's common sense, um, there's obviously a gap to be filled there. Oh, that's right. Uh, uh, Julie Olson in her lawsuit is arguing very strenuously and very uh, authoritatively, I believe, that is implicit in the Fifth Amendment. But uh, we ought to make it explicit. And that's what we're trying to do here. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, is there is there anything else you'd sort of hope um, our listeners would take home with them today from our conversation? Well, we the people are the founders, are the source of power for any government. The power comes from us. And uh, I think that we have it within our power to write amendments to our different constitutions and make them happen. But it takes public participation, public enthusiasm to make it happen. So I think people should contact and not just send a letter, but call and try to talk to their congressmen or U.S. senators and tell them that they want an, an amendment to the U.S. Constitution on the environment. They guys should do that. And if they're in a state that doesn't, if they're living in a state that doesn't have it, they could work there too. By the way, let me point out that in the back of my book, in the appendix, there are two or three uh, pieces that are very helpful to think to people. One thing we have in the book is a chart showing how every state in the union compares to Pennsylvania when it comes to an environmental provision in its state constitution. Mm -hmm. Show how every state compares. Only Hawaii and Montana come close. A lot of states don't have anything. Some have it limited to hunting, but anyhow, that chart is in the book. The other thing in the back of the book that will be helpful is a list of amendments to the U.S. Constitution on the environment that have been offered since 1970 and never gotten anywhere. They never left committee. So that's all there, and the text of, the, the text of those amendments are there, and that's in the book that will be very helpful to people. Yeah, that does sound that'd be, like that would be very helpful to kind of give folks a sense of the current landscape and um, obviously the work that's still yet to be done. And thank you again for taking some of your valuable time to speak with us today. I'm, I'm sure our listeners are really going to appreciate this conversation. Dominic, thank you. It's been a pleasure to do it with you. And again, Franklin's new book, The Constitutional Question to Save the Planet, The People's Right to a Healthy Environment, is available now through ELI Press. Thank you for tuning in to People, Places, Planet Pod, brought to you by the Environmental Law Institute. We would like to hear from you. So please send us your questions, comments, and ideas to podcast at ELI.org. And if you're interested in learning more about our work, attending one of our events, reading our publications, or becoming a member, please visit our website at www.eli.org.